blessing. Thank you, Buster. What a, what a blessing. What a blessing. He's here this morning. I mean, when you can make a trip all the way to New York and get back safely and, uh, and, uh, and survive all of that. Uh, of course, he got a little bit of what he deserved after being off down in, uh, in the sunshine for a week and, and uh, boasting about that. And uh, so the Lord took him north and put him in about six inches of snow and eight degrees when he left. <laughs> That's a wake-up call, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you so much, Buster. I appreciate it. What a wonderful song. I, I remember the first time I heard that song. How many of you can remember the first time you heard that song? First time I heard it was right here. Well, the Wilbur Hurt was here. I don't remember the couple that came and sang. Can you remember the couple? That, you're like me. I remember the couple that came as they were here with us that entire week and sang. They, uh, they, they're such a blessing and, and uh, uh, bless my soul. I, I, I appreciate that song. Aren't you glad God saves old sinners this morning? Glad he saved me. I bless his wonderful name this morning. We're going uh, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 7, and read some very familiar verses this morning, verses 7 through 11, and I'll continue my vein of thought this morning around prayer. I've been preaching on prayer on Sunday mornings and uh, somebody said, Preacher, why, why prayer during this time? Because I don't think anything outside of praying and the prayer life of God's people is going to get us out of where we are today. Uh, it is the need of my life. It is the need of your life. I need to spend more time in God's Word. And I, I think all of us could echo that this morning. But I, I know if you're like I am this morning, uh, the, the, the prayer closet in my life uh, is often the mo one of the most neglected places, and I, I, need, I need emphasis placed on my prayer life. R.A. Torrey was a great evangelist in the early 1900s, and uh, Torrey, uh, a great preacher, and wrote a number of books, and uh, he had a lot to say about prayer. Uh, he was a praying man. And... Uh, uh, Tory said, this is, this is in the late 1900s now, he said this about the time he was living in. We don't live in a praying age. We live in an age of hustle and bustle, of men's efforts and man's determination, of man's confidence in himself and his own power to achieve things. An age of human organization and human machinery, and human push, and human scheming, and human achievement, which in the things of God means no real achievement at all. I read that uh, while I was studying this week uh, around the verses that we're going to look at in just a moment. And as I read that, I thought, I, I wonder what R.A. Torrey would say about this generation and where we are this morning. There is nothing that reveals more about a believer's prayer life, man or woman, uh, a spiritual life than their prayer life. Basically, your spiritual life is going to be characterized by your prayer life. Your prayer life will tell more about you spiritually probably than, than anything else. I think that not only is true in the life of an individual, but I think it's also true in the life of a church. How we approach God and, and uh, what, what we're willing to ask for reveals how uh, our outlook toward God, how we view God in, in, our, in our spiritual lives. Here in Matthew chapter 7, we have one of the grandest promises in all the Bible, one of the great promises of God's Word telling us how to get our prayers answered. I will assure you this morning, I don't know when and I don't know where and I don't know how, but the time will come in your life if it has not already come when the most important thing on this earth will be your ability to pray and know God hears and answers your prayer. Look here in Matthew 7, down at verse number 7, and uh, let, let me say this about these verses before we read them this morning. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
you've got a red letter edition of the Bible, then uh, they are no doubt in red this morning. They're the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you cannot believe these words, then you have no right to believe that you're saved this morning. Well, you say, Bruce, that's kind of a broad statement, isn't it? Uh, if I can't believe these words, uh, then, then I, can, I have no right to believe I'm saved. That's exactly right, because the same Lord who tells us how to be saved tells us how to pray and, and get our prayers answered. And if you can't believe one promise that, that he's given to us, then why should you believe another promise? We've got a real problem. Notice our text this morning. I, I won't ask you to stand. I'll ask you just to follow along in your Bible as we read this morning. Matthew 7, beginning verse number 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Would you bow your head with me now? Let's pray. You ask the Lord this morning to speak to your heart this morning. You, you just tell the Lord, if, if nobody else in this building hears what the Word of God has to say this morning, Lord, my heart's open to that. And ask the Lord to help you in your prayer life this morning. If you'll do that, I believe you will. Father, thank you for the blessed privilege I have to stand behind this pulpit one more time. Thank you for the truth of the Word of God this morning. Thank you that I can come here with absolute confidence in my soul this morning that what I have read to those in this building is the Word of God. I pray this morning that its truth would impact our hearts in a powerful way. You know our needs, Lord. You know where we are. We often hide behind our smiles. We, we hide behind our... Uh, our, our Bibles, we hide behind the songbook when we come into church. But Lord, you know exactly where each of us are this morning in our lives, spiritually, physically. You know the burdens that we carry. You know the needs that we have. And Lord, thank you this morning. You, you have the ability to help us if we'll only look to you. And I pray for that this morning. I pray for every Christian here this morning that through the truth of your word today, their prayer life might be strengthened. I pray for that one who may be here this morning that has never cried out to you for salvation, that this would be the wonderful morning when they would do that. Strengthen our hearts as we gather around your word, and we'll praise you for what you do. In Jesus' precious name we pray and ask. Amen. For just a few minutes this morning, I, I want to talk to you about the simplicity of prayer. The simplicity of prayer. Prayer. I fear that often we are guilty of greatly complicating the matter of prayer in our lives. A lot of Christians are guilty of, of leaving that kind of, of impression with other people. Sometimes we emphasize the, the posture of prayer, how we're going to be able to pray. We've got to be on our knees. We've got to be spread out on the floor. We've got to be standing with our hands lifted toward heaven. Uh, and, and, and we talk about the posture of prayer as if uh, our posture in praying was something that was going to impress God. Sometimes we emphasize the language of prayer. I, I've had uh, folks say to me, I, I wish I could pray like so-and-so. I, 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 I wish I had the ability to express myself and they'll name an individual, and, and uh, often it's people that I know and that you know, and, and uh, I, I found myself being in that same place. But I will tell you this morning, it is not your, your ability to articulate what you are talking to God about that impresses Him. What God is looking at is what is in your heart and the sincerity of your heart as you come before Him. In our text this morning, the Lord Jesus in very simple language, I believe, gives to us the simplicity of prayer. There are three things that I, I want us to lift up here and, 
and look at for a, for a moment this morning some things that are so very important as we think about this matter of the simplicity of prayer. First of all, notice that there is a promise here to, to claim in our lives. I, I said earlier, this is one of the grandest promises in all the Bible. But, but it's, it's just uh, black words on white paper unless you claim it as a promise in your life. Jesus says in our text verses, Ask, and ye shall, it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. May I say this morning, beloved, there is no substitute for prayer in your life. That, that we, we live in a world where there are many substitutes for various things. But I, I have yet to find uh, a real substitute that does for you what the real thing will do. You know, we're all conscious of our weight. We're all always trying to find some way to cut calories. And so we'll, we, we'll use these, uh, these uh, artificial sweetener substitutes for sugar. I don't know how you are, but nothing, nothing ever really takes the place of sugar. I, I read and they'll say, well, this, this tastes just like sugar, but I've never put one in my mouth that tasted just like sugar. I, I think one of the most uh, I, I, offensive things that I've ever got a hold of was, was some of this stuff that they call that, that is a substitute for peanut butter. A lot of kids in our world today have uh, peanut allergies, and so mamas are always searching for substitutes for peanut butter. One of the, I, I'm telling you, one of the most awful tasting things I've ever put in my mouth is something that they said was a substitute for peanut butter. Substitutes can never take the place of the real thing. Uh, but, but I want to tell you this morning, that is true in so many areas of life. But when it comes to your spiritual life, and when it comes to the place of prayer in your life, there is no substitute for prayer. Reading your Bible is good, but reading your Bible without praying, you've left out an important element in your spiritual life. Coming to church is essential in your spiritual life. If you don't believe me, leave it off and see what happens. You're going to find yourself dry and dead, and you're going to find yourself under the chastening hand of the Lord. But, but, but coming to church is no, no substitute for praying. There is no substitute for prayer in your life. I believe the greatest unused, the greatest untapped resource in, in the spiritual world, in our spiritual world, is prayer in our lives. Someone said, what fools we are if we don't pray. Why the poverty of so many Christians? Why the powerlessness of so many Christians? I can tell you there is but one answer, and James answers that. He said, you have not because... You ask not. I don't have a failure in my life, but what it's a prayer failure. I don't have a sin in my life, but what proper prayer in my life would have avoided. I don't have a need in my life this morning that cannot be met through prayer, prevailing prayer in my life. What a, what a great lesson God's people need to be able to transmit to a generation of young Christians coming along that prayer is essential in our lives. Well, why is it that God wants us to pray? If you look back in Matthew chapter 6 at verse number 8, Jesus tells us that our Father knoweth what things we have need of before we ask Him. Well, with that being said, why should we pray? Why ask God to do what he already wants to do? And why ask God to do something for us when he already knows that we have need of it? Why has our Lord commanded us to pray in our lives? Well, we don't pray to instruct God about our lives and about what we need. In our prayer life, what we are doing, we are inviting God into our lives to help us. We are literally opening a door of invitation for God to come into our lives and, and, and to work in our lives. And there's a reason why we need to invite him into our lives. You see, God wants to do some things in us, and one of his key methods of operation is through the medium of prayer in our lives. Why does God tell us to pray? Well, let me mention three factors that are involved in that this morning. First of all, there's a fellowship factor. 
Can I tell you this morning that God desires to fellowship with you, his child? What an amazing thing this morning. God is self-sufficient this morning. He does not need one of us to complete himself. I love my wife. I need my wife. I need my wife by my side. I love my family. I, I need my family. I want to be around them. I love you. I, I, I need to be around you. I, I, need, I, I need you. But, but I want you to know this morning, as insufficient as I am, I can tell you this morning, God is all sufficient. He does not have need of a walking one of us in this room this morning, but to know that God desires to have fellowship with us. God desires to meet with you. God desires to speak with you. God desires to fellowship with you. In John chapter 15 and verse 7, Jesus said, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Those words, if ye abide in me, are such important words. That's the Lord's desire for us, that we abide in him. Certainly the Lord desires to meet our needs. But I want you to understand, even greater than his desire to meet our needs, he desires to have fellowship with us, that, that we abide with him. And therefore, God says, you're going to pray. And prayer is the way of you abiding in me and, and me abiding in you. You see, his desire in this world is that we do things together. If you look back to the Garden of Eden, God created man, placed him in a perfect environment. And the Lord came every evening and walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of that. Why did he do that? Because that's what he created them to do. God, God created them so that they might have fellowship with them and he might have fellowship with them. Sure, he could do whatever he does without us. God doesn't need my hand to get anything accomplished this morning. But I want to tell you, I cannot do without him. God does need, not need my hand of power to accomplish anything. But I want to tell you what I need this morning. I need the hand of God's power in my life. We need the hand of God's power in our church. We need the hand of God's power in our world. God could do it without me. But I want you to know the wonderful thing is God wants me to have fellowship with him and he wants, to, he wants to use me. What a wondrous thought this morning. God wants to work through me in accomplishing his will in this world. I have a preacher that I know. He's with the Lord now. He told a story years ago. He, had, uh, uh, he was pastoring up in, in Tennessee and he had a fellow, that, that uh, a good friend that was pastoring way out in Texas and the man wanted him to come down and preach a meeting for him. And he'd shared the, the burden with his church about going to preach. And, and one of the men in his church, a rather well-off man, uh, had an airplane. And, and he said to the preacher, I, I'm going to take a week off. I, I, I'm just going to take the whole week off. Would you let me fly you down there and back? Wouldn't you like to have that happen, Buster? Not have to go to the airlines and buy a ticket. And he said, well, sure. He said, we'll, we'll, we'll leave such and such a time and fly down and we'll enjoy our time together. He said, uh, you know, he said, I'd flown before, but uh, most, most of my flying had been on larger planes. And this was, this was somewhat a smaller plane. And uh, so the day came and, and they got everything on the, uh, their luggage and whatever, got on the plane. They took off, beautiful day, and they were flying. And uh, he said, we'd, we'd been up talking and just enjoying our fellowship with one another. And he said, uh, my friend looked over at me and said, would you like to fly the plane? And he said, I've never flown an airplane before in my life. And he, he said, but the temptation, you know, you know, you're a boy. You want to get behind the wheel of a car and drive. And, and he said, he looked at his friend. He said, you think I can fly? He said, oh, yeah. He said, uh, you, you, you can fly. He said, you're sitting right here beside me. And, and, and he said, I, I'm, I'm going to be right here and uh, we'll work together. And so he said, uh, he, he said to me, take, uh, take hold of the, uh, the controls. And he said, I took hand, hold of the controls. And he said, I looked over and he had hold of the controls on that side too. And he said, now it's yours. And he said, uh, basically, he just turned the power over to me to fly the plane. He said, we enjoyed ourselves. He said, I flew, you know, he said, a long ways. And he said, I didn't do nothing foolish because I knew if I got, man, I don't want to make a mess out of this thing. But he said, we flew together. 
He said he could have done it without me, but he wanted me to be involved. I, I, I could not do it with, without him, and I wanted him, to, I certainly wanted him to be involved. We worked together, and he said, we had a wonderful time. We fellowshiped all the way to where we're going, landed the plane, had a good time, and, and the meeting and all that. And he, but he said, the fellowship together was so important. Listen, that's exactly what God wants to do in my life, in your life. This, this life that we are living uh, is, is a trip through this world. And the glorious thing is, God, God wants to keep his hands on the controls, but he wants you and I to put our hands on the controls too. And he wants to fellowship together with us as we journey through this world. God wants to bless you as a husband. God wants to bless you as a wife. God wants to bless you as a father. God wants to bless you as a mother. But God does not want you to uh, want to have his hands on the controls by himself. He wants you to join him in this thing and have fellowship with him. Have do we do that? We do that through the glorious medium of prayer that he's given to us, a promise in his word that if we'll come to him with our needs, he'll hear and answer us. We're we are laborers together with him. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1, Paul emphasized that we're workers together with him. God wants to fellowship with you in your fathering, in your working, in your, in your mothering, in your growing up as a teenager, God wants to fellowship with you. So why does God want us to pray? Well, first of all, there's the fellowship factor that's involved. But then secondly, there's a development factor that's involved. Along with reading and studying the Word of God, prayer will cause you to grow in your Christian life. You see, when you abide in the Lord Jesus Christ and he abides in you, then you're growing as you pray. Have you, ever, have you ever wondered, I know you have because you're just like me. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't just answer your prayer immediately when you pray it? You get out and pray and, and, and the, the need is serious. Have you ever wondered why the Lord doesn't just immediately act on that and answer the prayer? I'll tell you why, because it's, it, he wants you to grow some more in your life. God is desiring to grow you in your spiritual life. What happens when we pray and, and, and we don't see an immediate answer? Well, I, I tell you what I've learned to do. I, I've learned, first of all, to examine my own life. Before I go anywhere else, I, I look at my own life. And oftentimes, the Holy Spirit has said, uh, hey, bud, what about this attitude you got over here about this? And, and, and what, what about this attitude you got about so-and-so? What about these thoughts you're having about this and about, and about that? What about your desires in some areas here? You see what the Lord's doing? He's working in my life. Why? To develop me into the Christian that, I, that he desires for me to be. God doesn't want selfishness to exist in my life. He doesn't want carnality to exist in my life. And, and, and when God doesn't immediately answer my prayer, I need to look and, and, and allow the Lord to examine me and, and look at those things. Why? Because he desires to develop us through our prayer life. Why, why does the Lord want us to pray? Well, there's that fellowship factor. There's that development factor. But then thirdly, there's the dependency factor. John 15 and verse 5, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. If God were to answer our prayers just automatically, there'd be no growth in our life. But along with that, if we never had to pray, we'd never learn dependency in our Christian lives. And we need to learn to depend on the Lord. Prayer is God's way of bonding us to himself. That, that's what he taught us in the Lord's prayer. We, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's his, it's his model prayer for us. Do, do you remember how he taught the disciples to pray? He, he said we, we ought to pray, give us this day our daily bread. He didn't say you ought to get out and pray, give us this month our monthly bread, or give us this year our monthly bread. No, he said get out every day and, and pray about the needs of that day. Why? Because he wants to teach us dependency in our lives. There is a simplicity about this matter of prayer that often we just absolutely do not see in our Christian lives. First of all, there's a promise to claim. Secondly, here in these verses, he gives us a process to follow. Such a simple process. It's right there in verse number seven. Three words make up the process that he's given us here. Ask, seek, and knock. 
Ask, seek, and knock. That, that's, a, that's a process, and it's a process of intensification. Ask, you receive. Seek, you find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. So there is both a promise here concerning prayer, and there's a process in this verse concerning our prayer life. And the promise is that God will hear us. But there is a promise of asking, seeking, and knocking. Look at that word ask for a minute. There, there we have a desire explained. When we, when we get down before God and we, we bring our prayer request to Him, we ask, we, we are explaining our desire to Him. The greatest, one of the greatest problems in prayer is not in unanswered prayer, but in unasked prayer. Not, not praying as we ought to. And I, I mentioned that verse a moment ago in James 4 and verse 2. You have not because you ask not. I preach a message out of 1 Samuel 12 and verse 23 on the sinfulness of prayerlessness. And there in that verse, Samuel made this statement, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Over and over again, the Bible invites, yea, even commands us to pray. Jesus in Luke 18 and verse 1 spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 38, Jesus said to his disciples, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. In Philippians 4 and verse 6, Paul said, Be careful, anxious, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Tragically, there, there, are, there are many Christians in this world today that, that are filled with care and anxiety and worry all because they've not learned to pray. They've not learned to carry their needs to the Lord. Paul said in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. That means you're to ask God for everything that you need. Everything that you need. One of the best tests I know of how to determine whether or not something's right or wrong in our lives is to simply come to that place, can I ask God for it? Can I ask the Lord for this? Can I go to God with that? <laughs> I heard my preacher years ago, uh, just as a young Christian in church, we had a, an old boy that got saved and he was struggling. He was struggling with his camel cigarettes and uh, man, he, he just really having a battle with that and, and, and he was having a struggle. Uh, I mean, he knew it was wrong and you ought not to do it, but he was having a struggle getting that settled in his mind and, and I, I can remember him going to Brother Bearden and and, and talking to Willie about it. And, and Brother Willie said, let, let me tell you, he called his name. He said, let me, tell, let me tell you one of the best ways in the world to help break yourself of that. He said, tell me, preacher, I, I'm, I'm looking. He said, the next thing you take that pack out and you get to one of them blooming things out, before you ever strike the match to it or, or the lighter to it, he said, you bow your head and you tell the Lord, now, Father, I want to thank you for this camel cigarette that I'm about to smoke. Oh, he said, I can't do that. He said, does that tell you anything about that camel cigarette? Well, sure it ought to. You, 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 you all know whether a certain place that you're going is right or wrong? Just get on your knees and ask God to bless that place. Boy, and if you're having a struggle with that, you better stay away from there. You, you got a desire in your heart for something? It may not of it, in and of itself be a sinful thing, but one of the best ways in the world to determine what's right or wrong, get down on your knees and say, now, Lord, I'm looking at this, and I want to thank you that, that for this, and I, I, I want it to my, I'm going to tell you now, if you can pray about it and thank God for it, it probably is not a problem, but if you can't, it's an issue in your life that you need to leave alone. We make a big mistake in our lives when we divide our life up into the secular and the sacred. <laughs> Well, it, 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 well, I find that so often in church today, that secular life, sacred life. We cut our life up like an apple pie. We slice that thing up into, into portions and we, we got the sacred part. That's Sunday. We go to church, but then we got the secular part. The sacred part, we wouldn't do any of that stuff. But the secular part, we think we can, can live just any old way we want to. Listen, I want to tell you, 
God is concerned about everything in your life this morning. As far as God is concerned, there is no secular part to your life and sacred part to your life. Every bit of your life is sacred to God. Every day is a holy life and every object is a proper object of prayer in our, in our lives. Pray about everything. We, we want to categorize things into little things and big things. Can you, can you imagine anything being big to God? Huh. Tell me what's big to God. Well, look over there at Lookout Mountain, preacher. That's big. To, let me tell you, there's a lot of mountains bigger than Lookout Mountain. Well, look up at the moon, preacher. Well, that's a big old moon up there, but I want to tell you it's not anything to compare with what God created in this universe. Look at our universe. Look at how expansive it is. Yes, but they tell me looking through these microscopes that, that there are multitudes more out there, and God created all that. Can you imagine anything being big to God? Can you imagine anything being too small for God to be interested in? I had some folks tell me some years ago they had, they had little girls and, and the little girls had a cat in the family and one of the kitties got lost and the girls were just so upset and they didn't know what to do. And the mother said, uh, called the, the, the oldest little daughter of her name said, let's pray about it. Now they got down b beside the kitchen table and they prayed that the kitty would be found. It wasn't but an hour or two that kitty was found. Do you know what that impressed that little girl about? It impressed her about prayer. Now, I don't know what I'd pray about cats. Hello? I don't know what I'd even pray about a dog. Now, you can if you want to. That's your business and that's all. But I'm telling you, there's nothing too big or too little for us to go to God about. Pray about all things. Somebody said, well, what if I want a wrong thing? Should I pray about that? I said a while ago, you ought to pray about it. And as you pray about it, I can assure you this, God's going to tell you that's wrong. And then what you need to do, you need to ask God to fix your wanter. So if you don't want something that's displeasing to the Lord, ask. Ask. Explain your needs to the Lord. But then there's a second word here. Seek. Seek. When you're talking about, we used to play hide and seek when I was a boy. That's one of our favorite things in the evening time, about dusky dark, playing hide and seek. Now, kids don't know how to do that anymore because they're too busy with a computer and a cell phone in their hand sitting in front of something that's going to destroy their minds and their life and they have no imagination. They're wrapped up in all that stuff. Seeking something is, is a discovery experienced. I said a moment ago, there's some th things sometimes that we ask for that, that are wrong things. Many times there are things that we don't, times that we don't know what to ask for. And many times we're not in an asking position. So then this matter of true prayer, true asking is linked to seeking in our life. Ask. Seek. It may be the will, the purpose of God that we need to seek. We need to search. We need to look for His will. I hear people talk about the will of God today as if it's as simple as getting a flashlight out and, and hunting a, a, a marble they dropped in the floor and, and find. Listen, I, 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 there have been some times in my life that I had to seek the will of God about some things. The word seek here is an action word. You can ask with a little effort. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort at all to ask, but to, to follow that up with seeking requires an effort on our part. In that classic passage on prayer in James chapter 4 and verse 8, James says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Maybe it's the presence of God that we need to seek as we pray. Maybe, maybe it's the power of God that we need to seek as we pray. Whatever it might be, if I understand James 4 and verse 8, it's going to take a concentrated effort in prayer on our part. Draw nigh to God. Seek God with your whole heart. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. I say it with shame this morning because it is shameful in my spiritual life. If I understand James 4 and verse 8, you probably are in the same position that I'm in a lot of times in your life. So often our prayers are careless. So often they're frivolous prayers. I, I mean, they're, 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 they're of the kind that 10 minutes after we prayed, we couldn't even tell somebody else what we had prayed about. 
We're talking about the simplicity of prayer, a process to follow. Ask, seek. And then notice thirdly here, he says, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Now that, that's, a, that's a determination expressed. To knock means that we'll not stop until we know that we have the thing that we've asked of the Lord. Or, or God tells us no. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. That, there, there is no prayer. Somebody said, God had not answered my prayer. Oh yes, God always answers prayer. You may not be looking at it correctly, but God always answers prayer. Over in Luke chapter 11, there's a companion passage to what we're reading here this morning. I want you to look there with me in just a moment. Luke chapter number 11. Look down at verse number 5 here in Luke 11. Luke 11 and verse number 5. Jesus again is speaking. And he says to his disciples, he's talking about prayer now. Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend. Yet because of his importunity, his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that asketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. The word knock here, just as over in, in Matthew chapter 7, is, a, is an expression of determination. To knock, to knock means that we'll not stop until we know that, that the thing that we've asked of God is given to us or that God has said no to us. And he uses that illustration there in, in, in Luke chapter 11 of a friend who has another friend who, who has come to his house. Hospitality was a big thing in those days. We, we're just about beyond that today. There's no such thing hardly as hospitality anywhere anymore. Somebody said, I wish you'd come over to the house. You get there and they say, make yourself at home. They really don't mean that. They're just looking for you to get there and get gone most of the time. Hospitality in this age is a dead issue. But in our Lord's day, hospitality was a big thing. And this man had a friend come, middle of the night, and he has no food. And, and he, he's asking for food for himself and his family. And this man has no food in the house, but he get up, gets up and goes next door. And he knocks on his friend's door. Well, all the family's asleep. In those days, the houses were built up. Downstairs is where they kept the animals. At night, they would bring them inside. You had to go upstairs to, to the bedrooms. In order for him to get up, he's going to have to get up and wake everybody in the house up because they all slept in one room in those days. They didn't have a blow-up bed like Brother James and Miss Anna been sleeping on uh, last night. But uh, everybody slept on a, probably a straw mat on the floor. And if he got up, the wife would be awakened. The children would be awakened. Maybe the baby that, that they just got asleep would be awakened. And he said, no, it's the middle of the night. Go away. Don't bother me. We'll wake everybody up. But that man doesn't quit. He just keeps knocking on the door. And he said, I've got a friend that's come, and, and we don't have bread. They're hungry. And finally, finally the man gets up and comes down and brings him. said, take what you need and, and, and go. He didn't do it. Because this man was his friend. But he did it because this man would not take no for an answer. He was a friend. But friendship only goes so far. It doesn't go at 2 o'clock in the morning. But this man wouldn't give up. And so he gave him what he was asking for. Now the Bible's not telling us here that you and I have got to pester God. That's not what it's saying. You, you missed the whole point here. If that's what you're thinking. We don't, we don't have to pester God to get our prayers answered. All we've got to do is be persistent. God wants to see seriousness in our lives. That truth is found in, in, in every word involved in the process of praying here. I, I'm told by those who help me in my study that literally what these three words, ask, seek, and knock, are telling us is ask and keep on asking and seek and keep on seeking. 
and knock and keep on knocking. That brings me to a question that people often ask. When do you stop in this persistence of prayer? When do you back off in being persistent in your prayer life? Keep on praying until you get what you ask for until, or until God says no. I've told you this before. Sometimes God answers direct when we pray. Sometimes God answers different when we pray. Sometimes God's answers are delayed when we pray. And then sometimes God denies our request when we pray. But God always answers prayer. And if we'll stay there uh, until we are assured that he has answered, we know what he's telling us. We need to keep on praying until we've got that assurance. The simplicity of prayer. A promise to claim. Have you claimed that promise in your life? Are you praying? A process to follow. Ask, seek, knock. But then I want you to notice lastly here in Matthew 7, a, a prof, provision to enjoy. Verses 9 through 11 tell us about this wonderful provision that's ours if we'll pray. I see two things and I'm through. First of all, I see an earthly comparison. Look at verses 9 and 10. What man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? Our Lord calls in delight here, an earthly father might, might very well be saved, might, might not even be saved, but he's an earthly father. And his children are hungry. They, they're asking for food. And he's saying, will he, will he not give the food to them? If a child asks for bread, what, what kind of father would, would take a stone and put it on his child's plate if that child asked for bread? In our Lord's day in this part of the world, there were a lot of little round stones that looked like a small loaf of bread. What kind of father would, would take a, a stone, a rock, and put it in his child's plate if that child was hungry for bread? Or if the child asked for fish? He's looking for fish. A, a common part of the diet of that day. Well, would he give him a serpent? Would he, would he find a snake or, or a, a, a lizard and, and lay that on his plate? What kind of an earthly father would, would do such a terrible thing to his children? Certainly a loving father. I'm talking about the kind the Bible talks about, the one who understands and accepts his responsibility to his family. is going to take care of his children. In fact, the Bible tells us that that, that a father who fails to provide for the needs of his family is worse than an infidel. 1 Timothy 5 and verse number 8. Listen to me, it's not the government's responsibility to put, put food on the table at my house. It's my responsibility as a husband. Thank God for our, our programs to feed the hungry. And I, I listen, I'm for all of that. But, but, but I want to tell you, there's so much waste involved in all that. You, you, could, you, you could almost feel the, uh, feed the population of the world with what we're throwing away in America today. Uh, I watch as I go to the grocery store and, you know, the government's handing out food stamps. Thank God again for that. When folks need a, 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 a food and the government gives them a, a card, thank the Lord for that. But there's so much waste involved in all that. But I want to tell you where the ultimate responsibility lies for the care of my family. Right here, as a father, I have a responsibility to feed my family, to take care of my family. If I, if I neglect that responsibility, you hear me this morning, a man that won't take care of his family is worse than an infidel. And I have absolutely no respect at all for that kind of an individual. And we're doing so much in our world today to create that kind of an atmosphere and that kind of a thought life. God, forgive us. It's one of the reasons we're being judged in America today, along with so many others. He uses an earthly comparison here, an earthly father. What kind of a father, if his children are hungry, would not set bread or meat on the table for them? But then in verse number 11, he gives us the heavenly conclusion. Look at it. If ye then being evil, you're carnal, you're worldly. People in this world are like that. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children. I like these next th three words. How? Much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him. 
That literally is saying that our Heavenly Father not only will supply our need, but He'll even go beyond that need. You see, God delights to answer the prayer of His children. The reason He delights is because He's good. God's always good. In everything He does, He's good. In every act He performs, He's good. He's good when He chastens me. He's good when He blesses my life with sunshine. He's good when he sends the rain into my life. He's good when he relieves pain in my life. But he's also good when he allows that pain to come into my life. God's always good. But not only is he good, but he's wise. God knows our needs. We don't even know our own needs. We, 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 sometimes we don't, have the, we don't have the foresight or the intelligence even to know our needs. But God is wise. He knows our needs. If you ask for bread... He's not going to give you a stone. He's not going to give you something you don't need. Uh, not only is God good and wise, but He's also able. You, you can be good. You can be wise. But if you're not able, you can't do a thing about a person's need. I look around and I see folks in such desperate need. And I pray for them. I, I cry out to God and... and and I think, oh, if I had resources. But, I, but you see, I don't have those resources. I'm not able. But I want you to know this morning, our Heavenly Father's able today. He's able. My dad, my dad, and I, I say it so often, and I'll say it till every breath in my lungs is gone. My dad was a wonderful, wonderful man. He was a wonderful husband to my mother. He was a wonderful dad to my brother and myself. But my dad was limited in what he could do for me just like all human fathers are limited. But I want you to know my heavenly father has no limitation this morning. He's not limited. I have a father who can hear me. I have a father who can answer me. I have a father who longs for me to be in his presence. He longs to take me up in his arms. He longs to cuddle me. He longs for me to put my, my head on his bosom he longs for me to tell him into his ear what my needs are. He longs for me to cry out for help in my life. What a mighty God we serve this morning who is not only able to hear, but he's able to answer our prayer. Let me say this again, beloved. We're fools in our Christian lives if we don't learn how to pray. It ought, it ought to be the supreme desire of your life as a Christian, number one, to learn how to read the Bible and rightly divide the word of truth. But number two, to learn how to pray. Our Lord very simply tells us here, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. We used to sing a song years ago entitled, How Long Has It Been? The first verse says, How long has it been since you talked with the Lord and told Him your heart's hidden secrets? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? I'm stressing the emphasis of prayer on Sunday morning because I don't believe there's any answer for what's going on in America outside of time spent in the Lord's presence praying. People are taken to the street. Uh, we, we've, got, uh, we've got social unrest. I, listen, I, I believe in openly taking a stand, but, but I want to tell you our answer does not lie in the streets marching. Our, our answer does not lie in taking drums and walking up and down the road beating those drums and carrying placards. I can tell you our answer to the needs in America this morning is in the, in the prayer closet on our knees before God. But let's go further than that. The answer to the needs in your life, the answer to the needs in your home, the answer to the needs in the lives of your children, the answer to the needs in the lives of your grandchildren, the answer to all those needs are to be found on your knees in the place of prayer, crying out to God, asking, seeking, knocking until you've gotten an answer from the Lord. Let me ask you now this morning, is prayer a vital part of your life? I don't know when. I don't know where. And I don't know how. 
But I can tell you there will, as I said earlier, there will come a time in your life when the most important thing in your life will be prayer and talking to God and knowing that God hears and answers you when you pray. Is prayer a vital part of your life? In our text this morning, Jesus is not talking to lost people. He's talking to saved folks. You see, prayer begins in the life of a lost person by them confessing their sin, admitting that they're lost, and trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior. That, that's where prayer life all begins. Thank the Lord he hears the prayer of the unsaved and saves them if they come honestly and openly before him. Maybe you're here and you're not saved this morning. That's where you need to begin telling the Lord that you're lost and you need to be saved. And then if you're a Christian this morning and your prayer life not measuring up, maybe you need to tell the Lord about that this morning. I'm going to ask you if you would to bow your head with me. We're going to have an imitation song in just a moment. If you've got need that you need to bring to the Lord, you want to come and pray about it. I want to encourage you to come. You got a burden on your heart this morning. I want to encourage you to bring that burden to the Lord this morning. Don't, don't sit on it. Don't sit on it. Act on it. Those words, ask, seek, knock, those are active words. Those are very active words. Don't, don't, don't sit on it. Act on it. And bring that need to the Lord this morning. If you're here and not saved, I encourage you, trust Jesus today. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth. Bless this invitation time now, Father, I pray. And help us to be obedient on what you've spoken to our hearts in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed for a moment. You need to come. I encourage you to slip out and come. Somebody on your heart, some need on your heart this morning. Why don't you bring it to the Lord right now while we wait?